Welcome to Canada Files. I'm Valerie Pringle. The Right Honourable Mikhail Jean came to Canada as a girl, a political refugee from Haiti. She went on to a successful career as a journalist, and at 48 she was appointed Canada's 27th Governor General, Commander-in-Chief and the representative of the Queen. She was the youngest and the first black woman to hold that role. As she has said, my own adventure shows that anything is possible. Madame Jean. Hello. Hello, Valerie. How are you? Very well. Um, you've said, I'm a woman of African descent from Haiti who came to Canada with her family as political refugees. And you became the first black governor general. I mean, how do you see that arc? How do you understand that? It's hard to understand, but I know where I come from. I know what the journey has been. Um, I know how I could connect with Canadians from that experience because so many of us have that in common. You know, we share that experience of coming and uh, from a hard, challenging life. Um, and um, it was uh, it was quite ama amazing, you know, to have to put my roots down in this territory. I, I think what made a difference, actually, it's something very special. When we had just arrived uh, in Canada and we were completely lost, it was a matter of it was a matter of life or death, and we needed asylum and. Um, and I, I couldn't figure out, you know, what this country was about, except that we were happy to be free and safe. Um, but one day, my parents took me to Gerasitage on Mohawk territory, and I could relate. I could relate. There was a great line that you had, I remember, you know, you were 11 when you came to Canada, and you went to a rural Quebec mining town, Thetford Mines. You said, I may as well have been Neil Armstrong with that step onto the moon. The, the step into this new life was yes. and, and people, that extreme. We were the only black family in Thetford Mines at the time, uh, yeah, small mining community. and. Um, People were very curious. They wanted to touch us. <laughs> like some overprotective, some, yeah, uh, surprised, others a bit reluctant, yeah. But uh, it wasn't my first experience of racism. It didn't happen here in Canada because uh, from uh, the experience of alienation, you know, uh, coming from colonization, um, racism also exists in Haiti. And um, because colonization was about dividing people, <laughs> you, your complexion, your, your skin tone, the lighter you are, the most you are considered as, as uh, aesthetically uh, nice and, and, uh, and maybe a bit superior. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And. Um, so what shocked me when I arrived here in Tetford Mines and I saw that kind of, of you know, reluctance to the other, uh, I thought, you know, how, how sad, because I think history has failed us. Uh, it could have been so different, you know, but with this uh, colonial ideology of dominating, uh, dispossessing, of white supremacy, uh, we end up with this legacy of, of uh, uh, characterization, you know, by race. And, um, and, and, uh, but the thing that really helped me is knowing exactly where I'm from and being very proud of my history, my, my legacy, my connection to the land. And my mother was a good listener. She was, she was very generous. And she would always say, you have to understand what's happening around you. Indifference cannot be an option, mm -hmm. even when it hurts, when, even you know, if it hurts and it's difficult. You need to understand and know that you can also make a difference. Well, it's interesting you know, that indifference is not an option, obviously stuck with you. Yeah. 
because even at university you were involved in women's shelters and studying about domestic violence. This issue particularly made an impact and you felt you had to stand up to injustice even then. Of course, of course. My mother was a feminist. Uh, she, she educated me as a feminist. So a very proud, independent woman, like my grandmother. My grandmother raised, she was a widow at a very young age, and she raised her five children alone on a sewing machine, you know, sewing clothes that she would sell in the market, and with one idea in mind always, that all her children, boys and girls, would go to school and have a good education. And she managed to do so, and, and she would always, you know, say that education is the key to freedom. That was, that was her thing, you know, and we would listen to her and, uh, and my mom was like that too. She was a teacher, she believed in education, very proud. So when we arrived in Canada to answer your question, the first thing she said, if you want to be really a proud Canadian citizen, um, do your best and help others and join the feminist movement in Quebec. So that's how I was, I was like 16 or 17 and I started, you know, um, yeah, that amazing commitment uh, and uh, being one of the women who, who worked hard to, to build this uh, biggest uh, network of shelters for battered women and their, their children. So um, I'm very proud of that. You have to, you know, be a mover and a shaker. You have to, to uh, make sure that everyone, you know, is aware of what, what this is about. And, uh, and uh, women's rights as human rights. And accompany women who are experiencing a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. And something I knew about, something I knew about. I saw my, my mother going through it. And um, so uh, I've learned everything working with women everything. Mm -hmm. It helped me also as a journalist later. Well, you were obviously a brilliant student and a linguist. How many languages? Five languages? Yeah, I speak five languages. And yeah. you studied Italian, you went to Italy and studied, you speak French, yeah. Haitian, English, French. Yeah, and I can read and, and I understand uh, Portuguese. I'm, yeah, no, no problem. But you were drawn to journalism and, and partly you talked about passion and resolve. Journalism wasn't about, you know, <laughs> being on TV. It was really about telling stories. Uh, yeah, it was like a, a responsibility. That's how I, I understood journalism. Uh, that's how I practiced journalism, uh, raising awareness, uh, sharing, you know, information and making sure that people understood, you know, the issues that we're confronted to. But you've had so many firsts in your life. You were the first black TV reporter in Quebec, you know, black governor general, um, first woman head of La Francophonie. I mean, there are were, there were a lot of firsts. I get a feeling you kind of like that. Like, just let me break that door down. Yes, let me break that door down. Let me break the soul, you know, break down the solitudes. Let me, let me, open, you know, a window for others to see on these uh, realities that remain invisible. Let me help people, you know, people's voices, you know, to, to be heard. And, and, uh, and it's not about being the first, it's about um, opening new doors, mm -hmm. opening new doors and making sure that people people understand what's happening around them. Just like my mother told me, you need to understand. You know, I was never, even as a, as a child, I was never in a bubble of innocence. And it was heavy on my shoulders, but it made me the person I am. Yeah. When you got the call from the prime minister, you were 48, like you're young, prime of your mm -hmm. career, but mostly known in Quebec. And he said, We'd like you to be the Governor General of Canada, Commander in Chief, representative of the Queen. Well, these were not exactly his words. <laughs> what did he say? First, um, I had many people coming to me, and I said, well, if this is what I think he wants to talk to me about, I have to think about it. 
because I couldn't go there without a vision, without knowing exactly what I could do, what someone like me could do. How would you embody it? How I would embody it, how I would be serving Canada, the country that gave me so much. You know, to become a Canadian citizen is huge, especially when you come from a place where, you know, you had no rights. So I took four weeks. Normally people jump <laughs> on the car. I took four weeks and they, they kept coming back to me and saying, what's taking you so long? I said, and I would say, I, I need to, th to think about it. So that's how, you know, I started, you know, imagining what I would do. And what did you come up with? And I mean, even now from in hindsight, how, how did you embody that role? First, um, I thought, and I know that some people, when I said that my motto would be, my motto would be breaking down solitudes, thought that I was thinking about the two solitudes because I'm a francophone and, you know. French English. French English, I'm from Quebec, and it wasn't about that. There are so many solitudes in our country, in our societies, you know, so many solitudes. And I thought that Canadians did know the country very well. I myself had so much to discover about Canada. So I thought, yeah, how about working on not what our differences are about, but what we have in common? How about crisscrossing Canada and going, you know, from one community to another and looking also at how young people are doing, not bringing them to me, but going where they are. There are many people who'd be watching this in America who don't know about a head of state in Canada or, you know, because they, of course, the president is the head of state and head of government and in Canada, the parliamentary system it is separate so that you have, you know, constitutional responsibilities and, you know, inspirational, you know, responsibilities, but it is, it's a very separate role from the Prime Minister. Who's the yes, head of, of course, government. the Prime Minister is a chief, is a chief of government. Uh, the Governor General uh, and Commander-in-Chief uh, doesn't have, like, um, executive powers, but we have, we have, like, a moral duty of bringing Canadians together and making people understand that we have so much in common and how we do things from one part of Canada to the other. And I enjoyed doing that. And you're commander in chief too, and you had a real connection with the military. I had a real connection because at the time we were deployed in Afghanistan. And um, <laughs> General Hillier taught me everything from donning the uniform to understanding that we were going to lose a lot of soldiers. From Kabul, we were deployed in Kandahar, which was really the most difficult place because that's where the Taliban were. And um, so I went to Afghanistan uh, three times, of course to support the troops, but also to engage with Afghan communities, Afghan women and men of great courage. Because I had said to uh, the chief of defense staff, I need to hear from Afghans themselves why we're here. And that I will share with Canadians who don't understand why we are in Afghanistan. And um, that connection was really important. Even donning the uniform for me was something a bit difficult. But it was an army, Canadian forces were about ethics, you know, rules, rights, and it was very different from what I had experienced in Haiti, where the militaries were about repression, killing, and uh, in, with a predatory regime. As you became Governor General, you had to go and meet the Queen, like people must love this story, mm -hmm. that you went to Balmoral with your six-year-old daughter. I mean, it must have been <laughs> quite an unbelievable experience. It's part of tradition before being installed as Governor General, um, you have to meet the Queen. 
she would never want to interfere in Canadian affairs. But we had the most amazing conversation. Can you imagine the most improbable thing? Me, being of Haitian origin, where decolonization started, sitting with Her Majesty Elizabeth II, heiress of an empire of slavers and colon colonial empire. So there was this big elephant in the room. And we were alone, just the two of us sitting next to each other. She wanted us to be sitting on the same couch. Two women. And I said to her, Your Majesty, can you imagine how improbable this meeting is? You know exactly where I come from. And she said, of course I know. And I said, here we are. And I'm free. And me being free, and people like me being free, also makes you free. And from there started a conversation that was so rich. Because she started, you know, to tell me about how she was born in colonial time. And then she had to adapt to different times and accompany the decolonization process. Imagine just one life. And then she worked in, during the Second World War with the Red Cross. She, for the first time, got a professional skill as a, a mechanician driver. driver. <laughs> And no one knew who she was. So she was a citizen among other citizens in a difficult time. And when she was crowned, she was the first sovereign who spoke directly to the people, not her subjects, but to the people on radio, and they could hear her voice. So that made her a very special, I mean, that conversation could have not happened, but I'm so glad that it did. Mm -hmm. Because we were two women speaking to each other. And from a story, an historical perspective, because we still live with that legacy. Mm -hmm. And she knows that. We still live with the consequences and the devastating impact of colonial legacy. So it's like a rebirth, you know. To understand racism today, you need to go back and confront history. Otherwise, the future takes its revenge. So I feel so honored that I was part of launching the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to see where it is taking us today. Because this is a moment where we can decide how we want to live together. Same thing, there's a special connection between indigenous people and black people. When you look at Statistic Canada, the most underserved communities in our country are black communities and indigenous communities, the dispossessed and conquered peoples. So that's why, you know. Can you be hopeful then? You know, of as course. you look at this, because you've seen, I mean, you've been part of this journey yourself and observing yes. it. What makes me uh, hopeful? The truth. It's important to address the truth always. It makes us stronger. You need to have this courage. Because even when I sat with the Queen, we both had courage. One, mine to address this, hers to respond to it. So this is how you build a relationship. Not through pretending that, and we like that as Canadians, mm -hmm. we like to say that. Be you nice. Know. Oh, we're nice. And oh no, we're not like the Americans. No, no, that's an American experience. No. Racism is also a reality in our country. 
Racial profiling is also a devastating reality in our country. And it, it makes, you know, people in danger. So we need to address it. And once you address it, the energy that comes out of it, we just had, like, my foundation is about working with underserved youth across Canada. And of course, majority of them, I said it, indigenous and black youth. And to see young people having this capacity to encapsulate the reality, their experience, into powerful words and images, yeah. using the arts as an, an incredible tool to open spaces of dialogue, to, to, to make sure that we can have these difficult conversations, but with them move forward and decide what do we want to achieve together, and together we're stronger. When I met Barack Obama, when he came to Canada, and it's tradition, only, only Trump didn't follow that tradition. The tradition is, once you're elected, your first state uh, visit as an American president is to Canada. And I had followed Obama since his time as senator, and even before that, social worker. That's what he was. And, uh, and I was like looking forward to this moment where we would actually have an opportunity to meet and sit down together. And uh, Obama comes down and we look at each other and it was Black History Month. <laughs> February, Black History Month. And he, he said, and we reflected upon that, who would have thought that the Commander-in-Chief of Canada and the Commander-in-Chief of the United States would meet on this day and in office at the same time, and both of African descent. If you look at the pictures, it's like we're, we're floating. We can feel history. We're happy. <laughs> Let us rejoice. That was the thing. And when we sat down, our conversation, of course, he asked me a lot of questions about Haiti. And I told her, him a story about, I was, I was just back from Haiti. There had been like, you know, a natural disaster and hurricane and cyclone. And, and I went to a community where everything was destroyed. And we were with the crowd by the statue of one of our heroes of the Haitian Revolution. And I was addressing the crowd, and there were many young people. And a young girl said, you are going to meet Barack Obama, right? I'm sure you will. Just tell him that if it wasn't for the Haitian Revolution, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be there as President of the United States. And you, Mikhail, would not be Governor General of Canada. It all started here. So I shared that with him. And I said, what do you think? I said, oh, she's so right. She's so right. Now, I have one final question that we ask, <clears throat> or has been part of this series, which is um, about being Canadian. So yes. the, the question is, what does being Canadian mean to you? Being Canadian means to me one thing. We're always looking for solutions. It's one thing I've witnessed as I crisscross the country. People are looking for solutions to tackle issues that we are confronted to and to come stronger. And, and what a beauty. Not just a landscape. We have an amazing, beautiful country on an amazing, vast territory. But it's also, how would I say that, the humanscape. You had a lot of time to think about that, about what you know this what? country is. My first, my first state visits as representative of Canada were in Africa. And, and, and I remember when I started you know, engaging in bilateral you know, discussions with other heads of state, and many of them, Latin American heads of state, African, they would say, but you were not born in, in Canada. You arrived in Canada as a refugee. And I said, this is what Canada is about. 
it is possible in Canada. Well, you did a remarkable job representing Canada, certainly, and it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. For Thank you so much. And we'll be back uh, next week with another edition of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of the Browning Watt Foundation, as well as the following donors. Ted and Alice Kernahan, Mary Davy, David and Cheryl Carr, Jim and Sandra Pitbledu, Tony and Sherry Fell, Bryce and Nikki Douglas, Richard Wernham and Julia West, Charles and Marilyn Bailey, Michael McCain and family, Richard Pilosoff, Clench House Foundation, Kathy and George Dombrowski, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.